About 30 years ago, the landscape architecture industry began feeling the pressure to move from hand drawing to computer aided design, or CAD. They did so for better collaboration, more efficient documentation, and space saving archives. As we fast forward to today, our industry is once again feeling pressure, or maybe just being inspired, to make a similar conversion to a more robust building information modeling, or BIM workflow. I'm Eric Gilby, I'm a landscape architect and the product marketing manager for the landscape industries at Vectorworks. In this presentation, I'm going to share strategies for your organization to consider when developing a transition plan for BIM implementation. From assessing your firm's current use of design and modeling software to meet BIM collaboration requirements and identifying where support is most needed, I'll provide a series of questions to ask yourself as you carry out this assessment and determine how to make office-wide changes for BIM integration. So with as much content as we have planned in this presentation, I thought it might be best to divide it into two major sections, the strategy in approaching BIM, and then a section about the implementation of BIM. So this first section is going to address your firm's understanding of BIM, your understanding of BIM for landscape, bringing BIM to your organization, and also managing a successful change. So let's jump in and establish or confirm the fundamental understanding of what BIM is and what it is not. And though you may already think you know what BIM is, it can still be helpful for each firm to take time to revisit this and make sure everyone in the firm is on the same page. This is especially true for firm members who have been along for the ride when they evolved from hand drawing to CAD and now are looking to move from CAD to BIM and it's going to be good to recognize the conventions which are similar and how they relate to the new representation in BIM. So defining BIM, whether it's for architects, structural engineers, landscape architects, it's all going to be seen as a holistic design approach. It's not just about buildings, it's not just about information, and it's not just about 3D modeling, but probably most important to note, it's really not about one application. And most firms are looking to move to BIM today are doing so because others have been suggesting or requested that they do so. So it's important to know why any of these preceding firms have moved to BIM. And as you're going to find, their benefits that they found will be the same for your firm as well. So from this image that we see on this slide, you're going to note that projects designed in a typical CAD workflow is typically done in the time spent when the file creation takes place in a less convenient time to help projects change when needed without costing the stakeholders for these changes. But BIM on the other hand purposely moves firms to recognize conflicts and challenges earlier on and this helps the project development to move forward with less risk of changing direction when at least can afford such a change. Yeah, so of course firms can and should expect other benefits when moving to BIM. For example, an earlier adopting firm, Perkins & Will, noted several of these after they switched many years ago. Of those shared with us by Michael Lipscomb, I'm going to point out just a few that I think are echoed through other firms. The improved coordination and collaboration. Sometimes we recognize that documentation in the CAD workflow has a lot of efforts um, being made to make sure that a change in one place is coordinated and, and recognized in another place. And so in this case, they see that that uh, process had been improved. Reduced errors and omissions. This is actually interesting because sometimes the contractors get a little bit nervous about using BIM because there isn't a lot of wiggle room because they've gotten so accurate in how the, the project and materials are being specified. Multiple people working on the same file. This is one of those things that we're not also used to unless we're using several files that are assembled together or referenced together. But in BIM, you have the ability to see other people working on the exact same file. They just check out certain portions. And changes rippling throughout the project area. So this kind of comes back to that coordination and collaboration, but really this idea that a change made in one place actually changes in other places really pulls that coordination all together and making sure that the referencing is really uh, doing its its work as well. So I often get asked what BIM for the landscape is and do we actually call it LIM or landscape information modeling or do we call it SIM for site information modeling and I'm going to suggest that for most people I think they recognize that the B in BIM which is building is more about a process than a noun 
and with this I think I'm going to agree. So let's just continue with the phrase BIM for landscape. For BIM specific to landscape, there are site specific features which I think firms can enjoy efficiencies by. And this first example I'm going to show here is a plan object. And in BIM specific landscapes, you'll note that these plan objects have a 2D and 3D representation. They have things called parameters which note their height, their spread, and even spacing. So we're getting to know this term par parameters as well because we're not used to designing by parameters. We're design used to designing by lines, shapes, and text, and symbols, and things like that. But objects that have parameters that can be uh, changed by you know, changing the, the factors that you're entering in or maybe it's just the the scaling of the parameters but they they have these things that kind of control how they look and, and operate and data pertinent to the height such as performance tolerances sourcing this is usually part of the information associated with these objects and so this is going to be used to help make plant scheduling even easier uh, so another uh, BIM object in the landscape is surfacing so objects like hardscapes or landscape areas, they bring similar benefits as well. And so whether you're using built-in 2D hatching, or maybe you're using 3D texturing, layering components, such as stone over setting base, which is over compacted aggregate, as you can imagine, you're starting to build these layers up, and this can all be included in a BIM hardscape. So documenting is made even easier by reporting your built-in area, your perimeter, and your volume calculations. So another favorite BIM object for site designers is the digital terrain model, showing both 2D contours, 3D surfaces. These objects are more easily created, modified, and analyzed, which makes uh, site grading even easier to do in-house. And we're going to recommend that you do that in-house instead of sending others to do it. But still shareable when collaborating with other design team members. So if someone else has already created some form of surfacing or contouring, being able to collaborate with them and work with what you're proposing versus what's been existing and vice versa. So there's really several other examples that I could have shown for landscape specific BIM objects but you know I think you get the idea about what landscape BIM means and so one important aspect about BIM that can't be missed is the reporting. So objects included in BIM, in BIM workflows are intelligent so this fulfills the eye of information in the acronym BIM. And unlike tables and many general CAD applications, you're going to find that worksheets are reports and they, and within BIM applications, are designed to harvest the data from those objects that are already in your BIM model. So imagine having Excel or Numbers spreadsheets built within your design application and they're pulling that needed data or that related calculation and with that you have an idea of what uh, BIM worksheets are and what they're doing. Okay, so this is definitely a different mindset than most firms are using in a conventional CAD workflow. And so you might be asking, well, why and how should I bring this to our firm? And I would imagine that the why is more known than the how. Uh, for example, I think your firm is feeling the pressure or requirement from uh, collaborating architects or clients, then maybe the jurisdiction that you're designing in is requiring you or mandating that you uh, complete your project in BIM. So the why is really not necessarily as much of a question because I think you're already feeling that need to do so uh, or that you're going to be providing your project in a BIM format. You know, maybe some of these are um, perspectives that you're already starting to feel. So as we covered before, there are a number of benefits to moving to BIM, but we also need to admit that there's going to be some hurdles to consider as well. And so I think it's good for us to note what firms have noted about these hurdles as they've done so uh, or in the past. For example, time and money. Learning a new interface or software solution isn't billable. So in the fact that a team is being trained uh, on this new software, they have to be pulled off of billable work to be able to get this new workflow learned. Uh, another example is investing in your hardware and software, especially if you just upgraded or signed on to another multi-year subscription. Training. We've just talked about some of this, but usually the biggest reason for firms to delay the move, uh, aside from the time mentioned, uh, it's necessary training is not usually without its cost either. So you're paying for the cost of people not being billable. You're also paying for the cost of the training. And then commitment-wise, does your firm really have a clear expectation and goal on how to make this a successful change? 
So you might actually be thinking of other hurdles too, but those are the ones that we've typically heard of uh, most frequently. So once you have a chance to address how your firm's gonna overcome those hurdles, it's time to plan for the new BIM workflows. And just like my advice to those who transition from hand drawing to CAD or to 3D modeling, your firm should seek to know how the expected product is going to be similar or different than your current workflow. And note that the similarities will help to build quicker confidence about how the team is going to work. And this should also bolster them in the new workflows, as opposed to thinking that everything is going to be new. And just like a real site design project, this transition is a project worthy of planning, because it's not going to happen overnight. And you know, just like other projects, it's going to need some proper project management to be successful. So it's true, firms have made the switch to BIM and then quickly realized either they weren't ready for BIM and then they reverted back to their traditional workflows, or maybe they realized that their projects weren't really ready for BIM or that their approach to BIM wasn't really completely thought through. So probably several factors that we could get into that have been the cause for an unsuccessful change, but this section is going to offer some insight from successes that firms have found because I think you're going to find that these are going to be of value to you and your firm as you begin your planning. So in speaking with firms who have successfully made this switch to BIM, we've kind of boiled this down to six essential elements that we've noted which directly aid you in this success. These are going to be vision, skills, incentives, resources, action plan, and evaluation. So let's take a more detailed look at each of these elements. So vision, and it's true that without vision, it's going to be hard to implement much of anything because if you can't see forward to what you're aiming towards, you won't know if your efforts are going to be successful. So with that in mind, you need to establish a clear goal that everyone can work towards, and this is crucial, and clearly communicate those expectations, especially the ones for the use of BIM and how that many of the projects where they're previously not ready and then noting projects that potentially are. Smart goals. I think many of us have used these in other strategic planning efforts and moving to BIM isn't really any much different. It's still going to be viable to establish those specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound goals. So in fact, documenting these SMART goals will help establish your firm's BIM vision statement. So examples of BIM vision statement goals may be your firm's expectations for BIM projects or maybe how many BIM projects you expect to accomplish in a year. Maybe it's going to be expected or required level of detail because you know maybe the amount of information that you're providing can be flexible and depending on what you expect needs to be that level of detail. Your leadership's commitment to provide proper support and resources. And then implementation timeline for one year, two year, five years. You can kind of establish what you think that that uh, expectation is for implementation. So our next element, skills, can undermine the best intended plan if you're not properly assessing it. So aside from your proper skills, firms should ensure that their team's passion and motivation are there too, especially if the skills have room for development. And one of the things we recognize is that sometimes firms can hire in this expertise, which is good because you're automatic, automatically getting that expertise, but it's also a risk if that skilled hire doesn't share the team's passion or motivation. So consider what training might be available for the BIM software that you are prospecting and establish how best that your existing team learns new technology. Because everyone learns differently. So often software companies and professional trainers can offer different varieties of this, such as you know coming to your firm to help you. Uh, virtual or instructor-led training, maybe it's on the web, maybe it's in a classroom setting. And web-based also known as self-paced tutorials. So sometimes you'll see videos or recorded steps uh, that are being recognized by either that company or maybe even users of the product have created their own tutorials. Ah, and then there's the incentives. So part of that passion and motivation we just talked about can come from incentivizing your team. 
because we all know that without incentives we will probably work slower and so considering these options for your first few projects are probably something you should take a look at you know seeking longer deadlines uh, you know if you're working in something that you're kind of unfamiliar with making sure that you're not necessarily expected to accomplish everything you don't know that you're doing uh, in a tight deadline so you should also plan to expect that there's going to be challenges and that a project could fall behind so with this extra time your team's stress will be lessened and then also you know only abandon BIM as a last resort you know the thing that I think that most firms are starting to think of is that it's easy to just get into it a little bit and then and then de determine that it wasn't meant to be and they just move on with their regular CAD workflows um, and maybe that's true but in some cases I think it's it's a commitment you have to really kind of have to find that way to to stick with it as much as you can and try to only abandon it if it's really your last resort and so reward your team when you've actually met the goals that you've established. Maybe you have something like a happy hour or everybody goes out on a specific outing. Uh, whatever your team agrees will be that rewarding incentive. And then there's uh, securing supportive resources. You know, part of the planning should also include the production of resources that the current team and maybe those who are going to be added after the switch will get to use to get to know that your firm's standards for the project work. I've seen firms create their own onboarding manual and maybe even sample project workflows to help their new employees get to know their workflows. Well, some of this could also be helpful for your existing team members as well, but ultimately this is going to be beneficial as you onboard new employees. Also, making template files and libraries. You know, we've already been doing this in a CAD workflow, so this isn't any different here, but it's really going to be necessary for your BIM workflows to do those template files and libraries, and so hold them so that other projects will continue to build upon them. And then, you know, I think it goes without saying that there's probably going to need to be a look at purchasing hardware to make sure that the software or the BIM workflows that you're uh, planning to go through are supported. So if there's any kind of need for boosted performance in your hardware uh, definitely consider that you know another essential element is the action plan sometimes we refer to this as the BIM implementation plan and in this plan I think you'll find that it helps to identify a project in its early stage for its first BIM exercise uh, so early on your firm could also team up with your consultants that you expect to collaborate with and then determine if you need additional software. For example, class detection and model validation. We're not used to using these in our typical workflows, but these can be helpful for landscape projects that are built on structure or commingled with other site infrastructure work. So I think you can kind of visualize the reason for some of these detectors. Um, so software that we're not used to using, I think, is something you should look at. And again, plan for that necessary training and then be sure to create your own internal BIM requirements because this plan will help your firm prepare for future BIM project requests. Anytime you have some of these things already kind of figured out when you're approached to do BIM you can say well this is how we typically or how we expect to do our BIM. So this brings us to the last of the six elements which is evaluation and just like vision if you don't plan to evaluate how things worked in your sequ each sequential project uh, are you really going to be able to measure for the success? So we recommend an evaluative assessment as you progress in a BIM project. So this helps because you're going to be adjusting it as you go along. Now, this brings us to the second part of our major sections, planning the implementation of BIM in your office. So we'll cover strategies to help define your new goals, assessing your current tools, as well as assessing your required skills and training, and then ultimately the part about moving forward. And so when it comes to defining your new goals, we recognize that this can be a moving target, which can be expected in your initial transition. So let's take a look at some recommended steps to consider when you're defining new workflow goals to utilize BIM. And so one of the first things firms usually try to identify in setting their new goals is how far into BIM do they want to go? We've already discussed the holistic nature of BIM and design and to take a brief glimpse into what landscape BIM means, but it has to be decided about what BIM or landscape BIM means to the individual, to the firm. And this is really relative uh, because when you think about 
the overall firm's expectations if you're not coming back to each individual person and understanding their role and how BIM is going to be affected uh, the whole team approach is not going to be consistent so the firm should start out at a lower level BIM um, should they work up is the firm committed to fulfilling a mandate requires a higher level of BIM no matter what the the firm thinks that they should be doing uh, all of these should be things that you consider the firm's scope of work and its design philosophy and its business practices should drive this new goal setting process as well. So putting these into a chart or table form I think can really help frame those goals. If you know from the chart that I'm showing here, there could be more than one description of what BIM means, uh, which can then correlate to the organization's vision statement, and then eventually offering a distinct opportunity to recognize where the move to BIM will align with or maybe even alter these processes or your services. So here are some sample goals which other landscape architecture firms have identified that help them in their move to BIM. They expected to find improved landscape performance. Uh, they expected to lower the maintenance cost and duration of maintenance. They found that efficiency in producing specific tasks like estimates or material takeoffs or even making plant lists. Uh, they found the idea or the goal of meeting jurisdictional codes, obviously that's a requirement, like site use, tree preservation, and water budgets, but using BIM to do that. So I think when you're looking at this idea of defining new goals, uh, start thinking about the project itself, the implementation of the project, the project after it's been installed, you know, as we discussed about the improved or the lowering of maintenance costs, even after the project's been installed, how it's going to be affected, because you can make better decisions about what's being specified uh, based on how it's going to get maintained or how it might not get maintained and how you should plan. And BIM can certainly help you with all of these goals. And as you get used to this idea of tables, uh, planning and goal setting, here's another example that I think can help. Once you're establishing your BIM goals, then you can determine a measurable objective to meet uh, and then provide a place to document if those objectives were met and if there are any lessons that you're learning from that. So consider some goals that could be scalable, you know, maybe the size of the project, uh, maybe the, uh, not necessarily the size, but the expectations or the mandate expected from that project. Um, later projects could represent a stretch goal. So this is another way of scaling. So knowing each project is enabling to grow as you uh, continue with each project, knowing that perhaps your goals are going to continue to grow as well. And where goals are seen to be unrealistic, revise them to become more attainable. And then plan for new goals as you experience or identify the chance to do so. You know, it's not crazy to think that some of the tools you're already using could be of some help in the firm's new BIM workflow. So assessing for these will certainly help, uh, at least for people to understand where they stand and then where changes are needed. And so in this next step, by assessing your firm's current technology use and design workflows to determine how to move forward with BIM implementation. And we see an example here from PCLD, which is Pacific Coast Land Design. They're out of California, and they noted their initial primary workflow and then what adding secondary might look like, and then recognizing what a preferred new workflow would look like. So you will need to assess the use of additional software, evaluating the firm's existing skills and those still needed, and then to ramp up to BIM, planning for necessary training. You're going to hear me say this over and over again, but it really is part of that planning process. And then the resources and its ease to move to BIM. So as you see from these diagrams, it was very explicit about how this firm expected, you know, from the design stage, getting into primary workflows, secondary workflows, how they expected to accomplish their deliverables. They really didn't want that second realm, what we see in the second figure, to get as convoluted as we see. So they were starting to think about how BIM would actually kind of help them streamline and become a little bit more vertical and a little bit more linear in a more descriptive way instead of um, more of that matrix and webbed view. So I think it's helpful to see what some other firms have done. Uh, the same firm. This is a diagram of PCLD's pre-transition workflow assessment. So noting earlier on that the collection of software here varied greatly from less CAD or BIM-centric applications 
But then that changed as the project matured. So as you see from the genesis, the conceptual, the schematic, each of those phases, there was a different level of each of these applications being used, uh, all the way up to uh, contract administration. So their new tool assessment reveals that their BIM application dominates their technology use from the beginning through the end. So the, from the very beginning stages, even through the very end stages, they're still using their BIM application. Um, but you see that there's still some other collaborative uh, applications being used. There's some amending or some appending going on. There's some visualization elements going on. But they've really kind of uh, taken control of much of the work in the project with their BIM application. So we can assume that most firms are like PCLD and that they utilize more than one application to accomplish all of their design and documentation processes. So it's not likely that a firm could or even would want to put all of these specialized workflows into one application, not even trying to pretend like that's viable. Uh, since each application is specialized to enable and support each part of the desired workflow, it really can be essential to make sure you know which ones you must have. And with the transition to landscape BIM, uh, I think you'll find that in some cases it's in inclusive nature of integrating 2D and 3D geometry, it's site-specific data, the reporting, the coordinated documentation, and analysis would mean that there are going to be some applications that could be relied on less and, you know, maybe even altogether removed from, you know, your overall workflow scheme or even gaining your firm efficiency. So that can be considered, you know, maybe it's something that we start to figure out as we go through each project that we're going to rely less and less. And then maybe in that year or two year down the road, we understand that we're probably going to be dropping some software. So creating a chart like we see here enables your firm to be very explicit about the existing workflow details so that the new workflow is considered and then each portion of that workflow is not missed. Alright, so similar to the tools assessment, assessing your firm's current skill set is just as essential as the tra in the transitioning process. And we're going to understand that most firms have indicated that the biggest reason why they resist moving to BIM is the need to train the firm on the new workflows. So they see training as a non-billable use of their firm's time, but eventually they realize that the projects are awarded to other firms. They're going to find out that, oh, if we're not getting into this BIM workflow, we're going to start losing those projects, and that's lost income as well. So you have to determine whether that lost income is going to be through training so that you can secure more projects, or is that lost income going to be coming from firms turning you away because you're not participating in a workflow that's required? So with that said, I think it's important to note that in BIM modeling and in site designing, uh, firms need to separate from terrain and 3D modeling that they have different skill sets. Um, they are different skill sets because BIM modeling requires an understanding of your basic site elements and how they get constructed or installed. Uh, it should also be acknowledged that having a team member that is proficient at 2D drafting and or 3D modeling doesn't automatically make them the perfect or proficient person at BIM. Uh, but those skill sets are certainly going to be critical when planning for training because that team member who is proficient at those objects will probably be proficient at the others. They just have to continue to learn those new processes in the new role. So to be trained in a new role, uh, how does that get uh, worked in and should that new role be deemed necessary so what we need to understand is what do you currently have proficiency in can those proficiencies be extended in a new um, tactic or a new role and then understand where maybe some people are going to be from scratch they're going to be trained from scratch to be able to accomplish their new uh, task or their new role and then based upon your organization's skills assessment and your BIM goals, you may determine changes are needed. Maybe it's even in the staff. Maybe it's in the titles. And the, the roles need to shift around. Uh, maybe you need to figure out how this can help you with a more efficient BIM workflow. And then think about who's going to lead this BIM effort in the office as a BIM manager. Who can lead each project? Uh, because they need to be asking these kind of questions too. Like, how will these roles vary from the existing ones? And is there a need for additional training or additional team members? You know, because we we see what we have, we see what we need to meet, and we still need help in certain areas. So maybe that means additional team members. Uh, what types of training might be necessary? For example, you know, your software, uh, your workflow, your IT 
um, resources, you know, things like that. And then who's going to perform the training and who's going to attend? There are two prominent roles that we find uh, for firms that are working with BIM. It's the office BIM manager and the project model manager. So maybe in a small organization, one person might have to assume the responsibility of both of those roles. Uh, but really, the office BIM manager's role is going to be similar to that of what you now have in the role of a CAD manager. Uh, they both oversee the development of standards and the workflows in the entire office. The project model manager is responsible for implementing those standards and then the workflows on specific projects. So the model manager also takes on the responsibility of the model coordination and then with that of the consultants and then the quality assurance and quality control of the drawing output. So in many instances, a project's team lead will serve as the, the model manager too. So as we approach the conclusion of this presentation, it shouldn't be any surprise to know that one of the most key strategies in implementing a successful transition to BIM workflows is training. I think you've heard me say this almost every other slide. And fortunately, there exist several methods for firms to consider, uh, as well as their team members. And along with any initial classroom or on-site training, your organization should also have an ongoing continuing education effort. Uh, this is going to include onboarding program we talked about before to ensure that all new employees are familiar with the BIM processes, their office standards, and how to adhere to them. So to begin developing an in-house training program, you need to compile a list of available resources. So, so far we've walked you through all of the major considerations involved in establishing a BIM strategy for your site design organization. And so the information presented serves as a guide for drafting your initial or your further developing an existing BIM implementation or execution plan. So as you embark into the move to BIM, we thought you might appreciate some other recommendations that firms like yours have been offering based on their successful experiences. One recommendation is to implement BIM on a pilot project, you know, of somewhat simple to moderate complexity. Uh, firms have also found that it's much easier to start a project in BIM than to convert one. Uh, here's another one. Medium to larger firms acknowledge that their transition couldn't be done all at once. They needed to manage both a 2D workflow and a landscape BIM workflow until completing those that were pre-BIM uh, were completed. Another recommendation is to use the pilot project to develop a BIM implementation or execution plan. So they use this first project to help them make that BIP or BEP, depending on how you want to refer to it. And then they use those project specific information to help inform that plan. And then from there, you can also extract a template for adapting for future projects. Another thing, remember your BIM workflow is specific to your practice. It will continue to evolve and you're going to learn much through that experience. It doesn't mean that another firm um, using their own execution or implement, implementation plan is going to be exactly the same and helpful for your firm. So just recognizing that this implementation is going to be kind of uh, firm by firm. It's going to be case by case. It's going to be project by project and a lot of which comes down to trial and error. And so it's important to document what your processes are, uh, what the results were that they yielded, and then also conducting a BIM debrief upon completing each project. So much of the content included in this presentation came about from the Strategic Planning Guide for Adopting BIM. And as you consider moving your landscape architecture or landscape design firm into a BIM process, I'm going to recommend that you use this document to support your implementation. So at this time, if you think of questions even after the presentation is done, feel free to email us at landmark at vectorworks.net. 